Hi there and welcome to a brand new episode of The Road Less Taken, the weekly web series from Nexus Consulting where we explore the journeys of people who've made unconventional career choices and excelled at them. My name is Venkish Srinivasan and I'm going to be your host today. I'm going to be in conversation with a truly multifaceted individual, someone who's traversed the realms of acting, been a top-notch behavioral consultant, organization development consultant and leadership trainer and off late has become a prominent social activist. Our guest for this episode of The Road Less Taken, please welcome Raja Krishnamurthy. Hello Raja sir and welcome to this episode of The Road Less Taken. Thrilled to have you here. Thanks so much for accepting. Venki, it is an absolute joy to be in this program with you. Uh, I mean, I, when I see you out there, both nostalgia and also uh, I must confess, you know, the youthful energy that you kind of, uh, in, you know, you bring, you bring along with you. Very, very happy to be with you Venki on this program. Thank you, sir. So I'm going to start the journey uh, by asking you, you wear many hats today, but let me take you back to your childhood. When you were growing up and when you were studying, what were your typical ambitions as a kid? And did any of these things that you le- went on to do later, did they manifest in your early age? <laughs> Good question. Good question. Uh, before I come to that, I want to appreciate you for the title that you have for this program, The Roadless Travel. It's one of the best books that I've read. Uh, In fact, it's one of the top 10 books that I always keep with me by Dr. Scott Peck, you know, um, and uh, he was a a clinical psychologist and also one of those people who ushered in this process called uh, group process work, reflective, introspective learning about oneself a long time back in England. Uh, So I admire him. So I like the title of your program. So coming back to the question of childhood, uh, Venki, I was born and brought up in Bombay. Okay. Uh, though I was born and brought up in Bombay and I lived in a place called Andheri where I spent my first 25 years, right. I was very lucky to go to a school where Tamil was the medium of instruction for the primary schooling. Passion for Tamil as a language began much earlier in life, number mm-hmm. one. But when you look at uh, the early stages of my life, I think you'll be surprised. Whatever multiple things I'm doing today, they were already indicators of all those, even in those okay. younger days. In the sense, wow. one, I think I got onto stage for the first time when I was about four years old. Oh, exactly. Yeah. I mean, the school parents day and the colony, whatever kind of day. So your action songs and I don't know for whatever reasons, you know, I got picked up for quite a few of them. By the time I came to the third standard, I was onto the uh, drama. I did my first uh, Tamil drama, Raja Desindu. Okay. I was sitting on that wooden, you know, kind of yes. a, a horse and, you know, the kind of right to, yes. to rescue, you know, kind of your, uh, you know, a Rani at that point of time. Uh, I also remember, uh, you know, as early as in my uh, third standard, writing my first Tamil essay and getting a very good from Gomati teacher. Okay. I remember my second standard, you know, you have this uh, uh, break periods where your teachers don't come, so substitute teacher comes mm. and then gives you a random assignment. Mm. I remember that was in my second standard, Panir Selvam, Tamil sir came for one of those break periods and he told us to do a drawing, mm. uh, uh, you know, because he wanted to just do uh, engage into uh, some activity. Mm. I remember drawing a lock, Putu, at that okay. time, okay. and getting a very good. So the fact that I was good in drawing, the fact that I was good in, for whatever reasons, on stage, mm. the fact that I was good in writing, mm. got kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, into, my, uh, into my mind very mm. early, around mm. that age. Mm. By the time I came to the uh, secondary school, I was already consistently the class people leader. Then I became the school deputy people leader, school people leader. Then I became the debater in uh, Tamil, in English, and Hindi. By the time I was 13, I wrote my first full-length play, directed and staged that. Wow. Very inspired by Cho Ramaswamy, slapstick wow. comedies, right. uh, slight political you know, kind of tones and things of the kind. Mm-hmm. By the time I was 20, I had already done six full-length plays, directed, wow. staged all of them. Mm-hmm. I had a captive audience, plus I did for colleges and things like that. Mm-hmm. And as I entered college, uh, uh, I, I first went to Podar College and then shifted to a closer Billy Parley College, uh, Danukar College of Commerce. Okay. And then I went on to become the school first South Indian Union General Secretary, school debater, okay. university, uh, you know, kind of a prospect uh, volleyball player, okay. and things of that kind. So these things continue. In other words, what I'm saying is, throughout, from the early stages of life, mm. I was one of those guys who did not do one thing. Uh, you know, I would actually appreciate people who do one thing very well. They go deep, they become mm-hmm. experts. Mm-hmm. I think in life, there is this uh, choice of the expertise pathway right. done by 95% of the people. 
Hmm. And then there is this exposure pathway, explorer pathway, right. which is done by the five percent people. Right. I, guess I fit into that mad crowd of five percent of people for the multiple right. things. Yeah. Great. And so with you had these early creative inclinations clearly. You had done a lot of this body of creative work, if I might say so. Yeah. Uh, and yet you went on to you know what might be called in the direction of a corporate career by going into a tier one institute like Jannalal Bajaj to do your MBA. Right. What was the thinking around that and where did you see your, your career shaping up at that time? Honestly, when I was finishing BCom, um, my feeling was I landed up becoming a union leader. Okay. <laughs> Full okay. People leader, college union, general secretary, joint secretary of the union and also fairly inspired by communism. Comrade Dume was a counselor from our area. Okay. I was very inspired by that. Uh, my principal, uh, however, you know, looked at me very differently. He thought that I was a very good leadership material. Mm. And uh, as I was finishing my BCom, he asked mm. me, Krishnamurti, what are you planning to do? Mm. So I told him, not very clear. I think, um, I guess I'll apply for some jobs. Mm. Uh, and he said, no, I think you've got potential to, uh, to get into corporate leadership. I think you should do an MBA program. Mm -hmm. now, even that was, you know, kind of first time hearing, you know, wanting okay. Encouragement to do it. So I said, well, I've not thought about it. So he said, I think Bajaj Institute has put out the notice a few days back. Mm. So why don't you apply and try? Mm. Okay, so I went ahead and applied and I got a call. Now I must tell you one big secret of my life. <laughs> okay. I, the day I went for my group discussion, Venki, I knew that I will be selected. Now you may ask me, where did you get this overconfident, you know, kind of feeling? Mm. I completely attribute that to Mr. Cho Ramaswamy. Mm -hmm. Because just few weeks before that, this nation, and I'm talking about 1973, mm. at that point of time, had encountered a major issue in the judiciary called the supersession of Supreme Court judges. Okay. Three senior most judges of Supreme Court were superseded by the government. Mm. That created a huge racket. Mm. Okay. And uh, Cho Ramaswamy had written over two, you know, kind of uh, uh, two, uh, two, uh, two issues in detail, a very good analysis about that. Hmm. Lo and behold, one of the choice topics for my group discussion was the supersession of Supreme Court judges. So you were so super well was, prepared. So well prepared because I was a big admirer of Chu and I was an avid reader of Tughlaq. Hmm. I yeah. came back and I told my dad uh, a very, uh, if I may say an arrogant thing, I told dad, if I don't get in, I don't think anybody else will get in. <laughs> dad said, you've always been a little bit overconfident. I said, let's see. And I got it into, got into Bajaj. Right. So it was uh, partially a mm. general streak of leadership, mm. but in some way, uh, you know, uh, triggered and given a direction by my principal, Dr. Lemay. Mm. I rest is history. I mm. was uh, very lucky because in Bajaj, out of the 40 students, we are just two students who have chosen personal management or human resource management. Ah. As well. Right. The, therefore, you know, Venki, what is the most interesting thing? For us in our second year specialization, mm. most of our classes, 80% of our classes were by visiting faculty. 80% of those visiting faculty did not visit us. We two students visited their office and had ah. a So you kind of got like a work exposure already while you were studying. Amazingly. I can't tell you what a blessing it was. Mm. R.R. Nair, Hindustan Lever, Captain Selby, Borosil Glassworks. Dr. Sharma, Godrej, I mean, I still remember K.K. Mehta, uh, my, my guru in the field of industrial relations, uh, Radha Mohan sir, mm. a whole lot of them. Right. And then I believe you started your career uh, as a professional in the hospitality industry. Is that correct? Interesting. What happened was the way you get a job in the uh, you know, MBA program also, you have typically this you know, kind of a campus interview. Right. Uh, I was in the final rounds of, I think, uh, getting into the final rounds of two of the companies. Lo and behold, we had one of the most amazing visiting faculty, Dr. Manish Srikant, who mm. later went on to become the founder of SPGN Institute of Management. Ah, okay. okay. He was the CEO of Mukund Iron and Steel, and he was our visiting faculty for business policy. And that was a common subject for all the 40 students. Mm. Mm. And um, I was very participative. You know, that policy making was something that I was very fascinated about. So our final assignment was developing business policy in our functional area. And I was, as usual, different. I was already an artist and, you know, uh, and I had a very visual thinking, even mm -hmm. today, the visual expression of things. So what I did was this good old days, we used to call them full scape papers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We didn't yeah. have the kind of facilities of today. 
Yeah. So I attached, I remember, three full scale papers, which means I had six sheets. Right. And I, do a, I did a flow chart of business policy. Wow. From there till here. And that was my submission. It was a very different thing because everybody had given bunches of papers. Right. And given, I had six sheets of papers. Yeah. And I had forgotten about it. As I was into this final round of interviews, suddenly I got a call mm. saying that, uh, you know, you are invited by the uh, general manager, deputy general manager of uh, Mukunda Street. So I went there and I went with Mr. Uh, K.S. Uh, Menon, who was the deputy general manager. And he began what then looked like an interviewing process. And we were into that for just about uh, five, six minutes. Mm. We got a call and he said, uh, huh, sir? Yes, sir. Sure, I'll send it. And I knew that uh, it was uh, somebody higher up. <laughs> then he said, Manish Bhai wants to meet you. That is, Manish Rikan wants to meet you. <laughs> I said, okay. So as I walk in, there is this huge table of his and he's standing behind that. Mm. Charismatic. He says, Krish, come in. You know, he used to call me Krish. Mm. Krish, come in. So I walked in and he said, sit down. Then there I see on the top of his table, the pile of all our assignments. And on the top of it, the yeah, spread of feet. He said, Krish, I like your paper. I said, thank you so much, sir. Truly appreciate that. But I really want to challenge you. If you can put into place 10% of what you've written here, Mm. You turn out to be a damn good personal manager, he said. Wow. I said, uh, it'll be a pleasure, sir. Mm. So he said, okay, no compromise on two things. One, on the quality of work I expect out of you. Mm. Two, on the salary we offer. Interested? I said, of course I'm interested. That's all. That was the interview. That was the interview. Wow. Fantastic. Great. And I think in uh, six months' time, as against two years of being a management trainee, mm. I was confirmed as a personal officer because of the good work that I put in. And then this great thing happened. ITC called me mm. and at my young age of 24 and a half, offered me the position of personal manager of Chola Sheraton. Chola Hotel. Wow. Chola Hotel at that time. In Chola, Chola Hotel. Yeah, the famous Chola Hotel. Yes. Nay, I had not even thought of moving out of Bombay. Right. Bombay was in my blood. Bombay was in my breath. Bombay was in my soul. But you know, it came. And at the yes. age of before 25, becoming a personal manager looked like a huge thing as a title. Mm. I said, okay, mm. that's how I became a personal manager of Chola. Chola. And I stayed there for almost five years, initially for three, three and a half years as a personal manager. Then as a regional personal manager or the regional resource south. Uh, and uh, worked for about five years. And by about 30, I wanted to become a consultant. So that's how it happened. Yeah. And, and that uh, very serendipitous move to Chennai also launched your, uh, your career in film. So when I was the personal manager of Chola, you know what happens when you're in a management institute is that you are in touch with your own group, but you're also in touch with your senior group when you're in the first year. First year. And you're in touch with your junior group when you're in the second year. Right. So I had in my second year Ashok Swaminathan, one of the guys from Chennai. Mm. Uh, and of course, Achu had his contact with his next year. Mm. So one of the days when I was in the hotel, I got a call from Achu saying, hey, I'm in Markara restaurant. Okay. Mm. I've got an uh, institute mate with me. Mm. Uh, so why don't you drop in? So I mm. went in and then he introduced me to the other friend, G. Subramaniam, and uh, we you know, kind of became friends. Mm. Uh, so we became friends and he used to drop in. He was working for a financial consultant at that point of time. Mm. He had done finance from Bajaj. Mm. He then knew that I was interested in uh, writing because by that time I already started writing short stories in Tamil. Okay. I've done about half a dozen star short stories, or okay. Guru novel. At that point of time, he shared with me that he was also interested in writing. And when he knew that I was interested, uh, not just in writing, that I had done six plays and directed and stage, mm. he shared with, me, shared with me his kind of vision of wanting to script and you know, direct films and things of that kind. So interestingly, Venki, we started uh, working on some story ideas and all okay. that. He used okay. to call that as one-liners of stories. Okay. I think we landed up uh, between, I think, 79, 80, 81. We must have worked on some six, seven you know, kind of one-liners. Uh, okay. Like that. Now, this continued for some time, and I think by 82, I uh, quit uh, Chola, mm. uh, and I went on to offer consultancy to Infield India, and they converted me to the general manager personnel of uh, Infield India. Okay. Uh, the MD of uh, Infield India said, you know, you are too young to become a consultant for us. So, <laughs> work with us for some time, and then we'll see. So, Subramaniam and uh, myself, we lost touch for a brief while. Mm. And then, um, after working for two years, uh, in 1985, uh, June, I quit uh, Enfield India to become an independent management consultant. I had this romantic idea of wanting mm -hmm. to go on my own. Mm -hmm. um, so I was on my own 
85 uh, end, uh, Subhu met me again and he said, look, uh, one of the scripts that we worked on, uh, which was Divya, uh, I'm making that into a film. Why don't you uh, work with me now that you're on your own mm. with your time management? Mm. I said, sure, because I knew it was a good script and I said, yeah, we'll work. Mm. Unfortunately, I could not find the time to do that because just then my consulting work, okay. training work. Just kind of picked up, yeah. Mm. I felt very sad, you know, I could not do that because at one level, that was in my heart from mm. childhood, I've done that. 86, then it was, 86 N, he came home, Western Nagar I was staying in. And he said, uh, you ditched me last time. I said, I'm so sorry. He said, but this time, it was a very good project. I want you to work along with me. Mm. It's about Bombay. It's completely based on characters from Bombay. The language, the culture, the dialogues. There's so much of scope of work for you to do. Why don't you work? Mm. I said, honey, this time, I'm not just saying yes. I'm doing it. Right. 21st of January, 1987, first day of joining shooting. Of course, we did the script discussion, right. many other things earlier, like before. Yeah. yeah. So that was the first day. And this good friend of uh, mine, uh, G. Subramaniam, is none other than Mani Ratnam, whose photo is right <laughs> to you. The film is none other than Nayakan, the famous, uh, you know, kind of benchmark film. By the way, Divya was the uh, script title of Monaraga. Monaraga, yes. Yes, okay. of course. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, and then, by the uh, way, I still have a, the blue notebook where I'm very lucky to have in Mani's own handwriting the you know kind of a one liner of uh, Pallavi and Pallavi. Wow, I have the one liners of uh, Divya. I still have the notebook. With fantastic, me. fantastic. Those should someday go into the National Film Archives or something because it, <laughs> it kind of launched a revolution in India in India cinema. So what has your what has your acting career given you? I mean, apart from, of course, you know, you, you are a recognized face and all of that. But what has it given you personally? OK, so let me also put this in perspective. Um, so we're talking about uh, 1987, OK, getting into Nayakan. And I think Nayakan, as it finished by July, I think by August, I got the offer to act in Satya. Hmm. Satya launched me as a actor in a, in a fairly big time right. because that was the main villain's role in a Kamalasan film right. and that character the suave smiling uh, mm. you know, kind of cunning villain mm. was a very different kind of a brand mm. and once that got released films kept coming and I kept doing in multiple languages mm. and over this uh, 30 years plus uh, 33 years now I've done closer to about 80 85 films wow. in multiple languages uh, wow. Telugu Malayalam Tamil and of course Hindi Hindi so it is, but with all that, uh, Venki, I must confess that uh, films have taken probably less than, probably less than twenty percent of my time. Okay, I think in India, uh, if you are a reasonably good, uh, successful character actor, mm. uh, I think this is possible. To do mm. two three films a year is very easy. Mm -hmm. So in twenty years, actually, I should have probably done hundred films, not eighty mm. films. You know, mm. by some logical count, I think right. people like. Uh, uh, Nazar and all would have done more than 200 films. That's Easy. my guess. Right. That's possible. So the first part I want to clarify is that though I've done films and I'm very popular as an actor, reasonably mm. popular as an actor, <laughs> uh, you know, it has taken less than 20% of my time. Mm. And I would say in the last 15 years, less than 10% uh, of Even my lesser. time. Even yeah. lesser. Yeah. Uh, but what I found was, um, you know, the childhood dream tendency of doing multiple things and the blessing uh, in life to be able to do that mm -hmm. and to be able to have this buffet menu of life rather than you know kind of a a la carte, a la carte. <laughs> yeah. and one single kind of thing i think that has been the most fascinating mm -hmm. uh, i would say that also brought in into my uh, film acting mm -hmm. definitely a richness of exposure right right i think that was huge right so i had this exposure to the corporate world mm -hmm to the world of administration, to the world of government, police officers. So a lot of my roles have been cop roles and, you know, very yeah. effective kind of cop yeah. roles. Yeah. I think this multiplicity of exposure brought a fabulous advantage of bringing in new perspectives and, you know, different kind of perspectives into the acting role. I think that was a big threat. I guess. Which role of yours is your most favorite? You know, having done uh, four languages, I think in each language I have uh, some favorites. Okay. Uh, you know, I'll begin with, uh, let's say in Hindi, Fir Milenge, directed mm. by Revati. Mm. I would say my best film. 
and the role of uh, founder of an advertising agency. So, right. Right. Outstanding character. I just loved it. Then I will come to, uh, uh, let's say, Telugu. And um, I would say that uh, one of the recent uh, ones uh, which I did with Alu Arjun was mm -hmm. one of the smallest characters, uh, but the main villain character. I did work only for three days, but one of the biggest hits. Ah. I don't even know why it became such a hit. Very nice. But I would say that uh, two, three characters in Telugu, especially one that I did with Guna, mm -hmm. uh, Guna first debut film as a director, I did a cop role and I loved that. The other oh. one was with our great Dr. Balu, our Balu Mahindra sir, Chakra ah. Yuhan. That villain role was stylish. And that was the role of uh, the culture minister, Hanuman Tarao. Mm. Where actually this guy, this villain, uh, has a you know, kind of a two-face. Mm. Uh, during the daytime, he's the cultural minister. Okay. And during the nighttime, he wears a wig, dresses up as a youngster, and uh, goes around you know, hunting for women. I think mm. those characters, those two, I, I, I would rate as... Uh, some of the best. Then comes uh, one of my very favorite languages, Malayalam. Malayalam, yes. Oh, Malayalam, I love the language and of course I love the filmmaking of Malayalam itself. The best one is um, uh, with Badran sir, mm. okay, where I did the CBA director's role with ah. Vijay Shanti as the heroine of that film. Yuvathuruki, that was the title of the film. Mm. That was the best. And the other one, of course, I've done with uh, Lal also, uh, Mohan Lal sir also, four films. Mm. And Anthony was one of my very big favorite films. Again, mm. a cop role. I was the commissioner of police. Right. Which brings me to the Tamil films. Yes. Because in Tamil, there are some awesome roles that I've been you know, kind of lucky to get. Uh, honestly, uh, Venke must tell you that sometimes you do outstanding roles. Mm. Those films don't become very big hits. Commercial hits, yeah. You've mm. got to, you know, always balance mm. this factor mm. in life. For example, uh, the kind of roles that I've done in film like Ananda Tandavan. Mm. It's a Sujata novel. Right. Just made into a film, Ananda Tandavan. A film called Dhinandurum by a debut director, Nagarajan. The kind of characters that I've done in those films, the fil character I've done in Ramana Abdullah for Balu mm. I would say they are some of the awesome kind of characters mm. that I've done. Mm. But if you really look at the combination of awesome characters and which also became very popular, commercially well known, yeah. Commercially well known. I think straight away, I think uh, Basha, the commissioner of police, of course, is the all time, you know, yeah. kind of, kind yeah. of roles that one could do. Right. Then uh, the, uh, the role in Bombay. Bombay, I was just going to say that. Yeah. It's one of my favorite roles of yours. Okay. Uh, uh, Bashir Bhai, I would say that it's so yeah. close to my heart. One yeah. yeah. So there how, that's how it goes. Uh, Fantastic. So I'm going to now ask you about your. Um, what takes up possibly the largest amount of your time uh, of late, which is all your work around uh, uh, OD, leadership, leadership training, and so on. Mm -hmm. What is your approach to this? What, what, what kind of methodologies, what kind of innovations do you bring to the table? Because it must be very challenging because you deal with companies and people of all kinds from all over the country, possibly all over the world, many cultures. Many sizes, many challenges. How how do you kind of you know interweave all of those? Yeah, um, you know it's a bit, it's been a fabulous journey. Now this is what this is the thirty fifth year. Okay, June uh, two thousand twenty is the thirty fifth year of being an independent consultant. Uh, it's a broad definition: organization development consultant. So there have been you know part of these journeys uh, have included the shades of being a, a, a trainer. Mm. and a, a large amount of uh, advisory work as a consultant, mm. Mm. a fair amount of work as a leadership coach and a mentor right. to organizations, right. right? and a whole lot of things. Um, so working in multiple areas related to the organization. Mm. Venki, I would first begin by saying that I was so blessed to have awesome teachers, mm. gurus in my life. Mm. So I would say that their you know, kind of uh, you know, hand uh, on my shoulder has been an uh, amazing, amazing kind of a gift to build clarity and perspective about many things of life. I would in particular talk about uh, uh, KK Mehta, who did the initial exposure to uh, you know, human behavior for me. And I think the first steps into sensitivity training. And I think very soon, in the next few years, lifelong journey with uh, Dr. Pulin Gurk from IM Amdavar, who is my guru in the field of organization behavior. 
this whole area of conceptual clarity and the ability to create frameworks mm. of awesome nature. Yeah. I think that's a gift because yeah. I believe that in that uh, it happens through me, but I'm not the person creating it because some of them are such interesting, mind blowing kind of you know concepts yeah. and ideas. Yeah. Some of the models that I brought in on transformational leadership are really path breaking, and I think I would, they have over these 25, 30 years stood the test of time. Uh, have benefited organizations immensely and therefore, you know, it has kind of worked. Then there is this very interesting combination, Venki, of having been a speaker all the time in life, mm, right. having been a leader of some kind, and therefore as a combination of those along with uh, a very, very high human sensitivity made me become also an inspirational, motivational speaker. Yes, of course. Yes. Okay. Now, as this journey of becoming a motivational speaker started happening, let's say almost 30, 35 years back, somewhere, I think, uh, you know, by the time I was about 35, also this exposure into spirituality happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I think one of the first earliest encounters was my very, very sudden and unexpected kind of a encountering of this book, The Tao of Physics by Dr. Frigerov Capra. Right. And therefore, this whole journey into the mystery of spirituality. Mm -hmm. And I was very lucky to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation because he was in Bombay in oh, 1982 nice. February. And I think this deeper search and then getting into this uh, whole field of uh, Atma Jnana mm. or self-awareness, I think right. that. No, I think it has, it has such a universal, even if I say a word application, I'm discounting that factor, okay? Let me not say. Because it's, a, it's, it's, it's an existential reality, mm. okay? soulfulness being the Atma that you are. And Atma can be described in many, many ways. In all the faiths, therefore, for example, Islam beautifully says that one single Atman from which the whole creation has been you know, kind of made. Like in Christianity, God, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they talk of the Holy Spirit living into the soul of each human being. Mm -hmm. And the same thing, the Paramatma and the Jivatma concept in Hindu. I think mm -hmm. with that also, you know, kind of becoming part of life, I think life became incredible. So I would say that the whole perspective of consultancy, the whole perspective of training, the whole perspective of motivational talks, the whole perspective of coaching, the whole perspective of social activism, mm. all of them got founded on this fundamental spiritual understanding of the human being. And then developing further from that, a concept of a dharmic world, a world of collaboration, a world of coexistence, a world of brotherhood. This immense capacity that all of us to live a life unlimited. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. In fact, that's my punchline, even in my website, living life unlimited. Unlimited. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And, and you kind of also took that whole uh, urge to create this positivity all around you to the next level with a lot of your activism, if I might call it that related initiatives, including a brief uh, plunge or attempt into the rough and tumble of electoral politics as well last time. Uh, tell us about how some of those initiatives are going. What are you aiming to do? So uh, as much as I was uh, you know, socially active, when I say socially active, I was one of those guys who never was an observer about the, the social rights and the social wrongs. I would act. Mm -hmm. In fact, my wife calls me as uh, one of the part-time you know, traffic policemen. <laughs> <laughs> If I see somebody violating traffic rules, I'm not one of those guys who curses or mm. he says how terrible this country is. Mm. There are many, many times where I stop and I check the person and I tell him very clearly that it's not acceptable. Sometimes very nicely, sometimes <laughs> very, very strongly. Right. Venki, I would also tell you that 50% of the time when mm. I'm stuck in a traffic jam situation, beyond 10 minutes or five, let's say whatever bit of time, I'm not sitting in my car. Mm. I get out. I'm right there where the traffic jam has taken place and I'm directing the traffic. Wow. I have that sense of ownership. Yeah, these are all part of my character. That's the way I have been. Wow. Uh, so long and short of it, therefore, I, I, I act mm. when I think that this society uh, is uh, having a matter of concern. Mm. So way back, uh, I think uh, beginning of 2005, 2006, I started expressing my concerns, whether it was television programs, whether it was public forums mm. related to this and started talking actively. By 2010, uh, uh, I, I got into expressing it even more strongly. I started having placards. I would uh, be at Tiruvannamur Beach or Marina Beach. I would sit and make posters 
and you know, kind of ask uh, the general public to walk around carrying the posters. Posters against corruption, posters for collaboration and understanding between human beings, posters for a better society. I remember very distinctly in 2011, another very interesting thing happened. Anna Hazari uh, was launching the India Against Corruption movement. Right. There was this uh, uh, meeting in IIT uh, Chennai, IIT Madras, uh, where I shared the platform along with uh, uh, Arvind, Arvind Kejriwal. Okay. And uh, uh, the voice started kind of getting heard, you know, loud and uh, mm. quite, you know, kind of widely. Mm. And uh, I played a reasonably active role in the uh, Tamil Nadu, especially the Chennai part of the India Against Corruption agitation movement that took place. Mm. And I knew that uh, from then it was, uh, you know, on. Uh, uh, then I got involved with uh, Nallor Vattam along with uh, Balu Aya, as I call him. And then uh, mentoring and encouraging youngsters to become, take on social leadership role. Right. That started kind of flowing. But then I realized one thing. Social service, NGOs, uh, it's a very respectable kind of a thing. It's a necessity for the society. But you know what? Uh, unfortunately, maybe across the world, but definitely in India, NGOs and social service organizations are like ambulances. You have accidents, you have emergency, you go to them. Mm. So somewhere, you know, they play that role, but they play the role for the exceptional situations. Right, right. Society doesn't get influence. Society doesn't get change. But then you realize that proactive change is possible only in one way, and that is true electoral politics. And I was really wondering as to why, especially in Tamil Nadu, the electoral politics has so much of, if I can use the term, essence of hate mm. and, you know, kind of doubt and distancing. Because I find it very, very strange, having lived in multicultural societies like uh, Maharashtra, having traveled across the country, having worked in multiple language films. Why is this intensity of hate and perpetuation of doubt and distance in Tamil Nadu was a big question. Mm. And I realized that there's no way I'm going to learn about it deeply unless I dive deep myself. Get into it yourself. And that was the reason why I stood for election. That was the one and the only reason I said, let me get on. Let me do ground level campaign. Let me shake hands with people. Let me talk to them. Right. So when he, I did almost about uh, 90, 90 plus street side meetings. And believe me, the learnings were awesome. I mean... Uh, I, uh, to summarize that, I can, uh, I can only say that I learned very, very uh, sadly that the electoral politics of Tamil Nadu, at least in the last uh, 40, 50 years, has been influenced by two strong E factors. Yes. Why they are called E factors? One is an economic factor. Right. How much money get paid right. to the voters and corrupted? Mm. The other one is emotional <laughs> trigger with hate. Yeah. Emotionally make people hate somebody, mm. doubt somebody, distance somebody. Mm. I think these two things, for some strange reason, had succeeded in Tamil Nadu. And then I became a lot more determined that we must do something to change that. Change this. So I think from 2016, I'm very clearly into this pathway, change the socio-cultural scenario or the canvas, if possible, with a transformative leadership program. I think that's what I'm into. Amazing, sir. Amazing and very, very, very inspiring. You have seen life, you know, in, in, its, in its richness and its glory and you have so, much, so many insightful experiences. Today we are in a, in a really possibly what has been the most challenging times for humanity for quite a while across the world. Uh, what is it that you would tell people today, especially, you know, young people out there in, in this current situation of the of the COVID pandemic and, um, you know, all of the uncertainty that looms all over, all around us. The world has been caught up with what I call as the objective material reality too intensely, especially in the last couple of centuries. And what you see now is the manifestation of the ultimate level of insensitivity brought in by this objective material reality. Now, what do I mean by objective material reality? Because the objective reality or material reality is determined by only three factors, essentially. Value for time, value for quantity, value for quality. That's what makes an objective reality or a material. And our normal understanding is, as far as time is concerned, improvement is when you are faster, you are better. Mm. When it comes to quantity, the idea is you, there is improvement when you have more than more, before. Yeah. 
about quality it is about better quality than before right i'm saying so far perfectly okay but these things can exist provided there is a deep human sensitivity mm-hmm. and there is a respect for the integrated you know kind of reality of what is called as dharma very beautiful term dharma is the holding of things in balance now what happens is when you lose the human sensitivity when you lose respect for nature when you take environment for granted mm. the same element three elements they go haywire instead of speed you get into haste mm. instead of growth you get into greed mm. and instead of better quality you get into exclusivity and arrogance and what manifest into the ultimate levels of these three is what you see in the superpower syndrome across the world wow. so what are the kind of messages that you pick up you must have the killer instinct to succeed in life how many times you must have heard this wenki very very many times yeah life is competitive why are we not telling our children life is collaborative love life is someone something to be enjoyed with love affection Mm. extending our arms to each other mm. why is, why are people not talking about it mm. why is every random child every poor little child from every school from primary school level up to his you know getting into plus 2 bombarded with this idea life is competitive you better get prepared you better get prepared where is this hap- why is this happening mm. and the ultimate level of this competitive you know kind of myth is when you start doubting your own neighbor maybe <laughs> your brother and sister ridiculous i would say winky nature was watching all this mm. and this is one of those gentle slaps that it gave to humanity saying hey take it easy you are driving too hasty mm. i would say that this is a wake up call to humanity mm. and honestly winky let's take even a period of 6 months 6 months take it against the last 30 years last 50 years last 100 years what is 6 months nothing Right. if six months of time mm-hmm. the history of the world over the last 100 years has got to be such a panic is such a uh, you know a disaster such a you know kind of worrisome period something is seriously wrong with humanity let's get it clear therefore i'm saying it's a great opportunity for us to build perspective and discover and i would say uh, the analogy of the automobile is the most relevant one okay you know scientifically one of the greatest findings of uh, for the mankind is automobiles mm. but remember at the height of building the automobile the scientist or the person who invented he put a reverse gear mm. <laughs> life is not all about going forward all the time blindly once in a while pause if necessary take a reverse gear go maybe half a mile back to find a better pathway to move forward this is the reverse gear pathway for humanity and i think it's fantastic time for us to reflect mindless you know kind of consumerism that we are into all this haste nobody can travel anywhere forget about haste <laughs> correct and correct. what happened to you you are you are pretty okay man what's your problem and i would say this is the time for us to discover what i call as the 5s principles there is this Japanese five S concept. Mm-hmm. Yes, this is a different five S concept that okay. I talk. About. The first S that I talk about is therefore sensitivity mm. to human beings, to nature, to environment, and to really pay attention. Along with that comes what I call as not just social responsibility, social accountability. Mm. You are accountable to what happens in society. I saw this beautiful thing in Bhutan. In Bhutan, the slogan is. you are responsible for your waste mm. not just for cleanliness they say if there is a waste that you create you bloody will manage that and the third one is therefore a concept of share care and sacrifice if required but share care okay so don't any more think about just yourself okay and get into this trip i think this whole syndrome of you know i'm a person who loves entrepreneurship and all that so i have great appreciation for startups but i think we need to know a difference between startups and upstarts okay today every town dick and harry because what is the idea i want to become an md in a matter of 2 years perfectly okay and what you are i want to have probably a billion in the next 3 years come on give us a break share care and sacrifice is required as against this mindless you know self centeredness that is happening and i would say the fourth one coming out of that is very simple beautiful message of mahatma gandhi 
sada jivan ucha vichar simplicity and all this will happen provided there is self awareness i think this is an opportunity for us to find this 5s anchors of life that amazing. is what I would say. amazing sir amazing i think uh, uh, this is this is really really uh, impactful insightful i don't know how else to describe it thank you so much for this thank you so much for sharing this uh, i'm now going to uh, you know ask you to close this interview and this segment on a on a on a fun note uh, please show a copy of the book to our our, our viewers oh yeah so we have uh, you know two of them uh, one is the original kind of thing that i came and you know the yeah. later part of it you know these two so it's uh, called rajni's panch tantra and yeah. uh, by the way i will first let's get it clear the credit first goes to pc bala i was uh, a co-author pc bala subramaniam okay. so uh, rajni's panch tantra uh, uh, was one of those really uh, fun exercises when i say fun exercises the process of doing it was such enjoyable one that's why i'm calling it right um and therefore we picked up 30 punch dialogues okay. of uh, talaiwar superstar rajni gan sara uh, and um, you know i always found that uh, i'm a very dialogue oriented person i was yes. a writer myself yeah. i love dialogues uh, dialogues have their own kind of special place mm. and punch dialogues mm. in tamil films especially i think they got a very very special place with uh, uh, superstar rajni rajni sir yes uh, you know beautiful they are like the Uh, uh, if I can use the term Tamil film Tirukurals, okay? Right, right. Tirunur Tirukural is for the whole humanity, but I think there is this Tamil film Tirukural. Yes. Uh, so we picked them up. Mm. So I, I, I focused on uh, you know looking at them as value statements of life, mm. Mm. and Bala worked on that as uh, value statements for business, and then we put that together. Okay. I think that was a great exercise. Great. And I would say these books have done. reasonably well fantastically well uh, my uh, most favorite quote is not in this book okay. but something that rajni sir shared with me okay uh, uh, that happened when we were flying back from bangalore uh, so as we were chatting about many things of course uh, he's uh, he's also reasonably spiritual and you yes, know he looks at life reflects on life philosophically mm -hmm. so he was sharing in his usual style and saying Uh, you know why do people complicate life so much it's so easy isn't it to understand life and to live it very well and he was so self effacive uh, he said something like uh, you know if uh, an ordinary 12th standard past bus conductor can become rajnikanth uh, kitty sir anybody can become anything in life they must believe in themselves but then he came with a fantastic fantastic punchline which i would remember for lifetime and he said Kitty sir, after all, what do human beings require in life? Now comes the punchline. After all, they require a body which is useful and a mind which is peaceful, right? Wow, <laughs> very nice. A body which is useful and a mind which is peaceful. Sir, and that's what makes a conversation with you very, very interesting. Thank you so very much, Raja sir, for your time and for being on this episode of the Road Less Taken. very very grateful that you could spare your time and share your wonderful insights with us rinky the first thing is i love talking two i love talking to friends like you three i love talking when some inspiring questions like the one that you asked for uh, come in after all sharing is all about uh, uh, the joy of life and i think uh, i'm lucky that uh, divinity has uh, gifted this clarity of mind and some capability to converse and to bring in concepts and ideas into people's life which provides hope which provides possibility which provides possibly joy and happiness in life thank, thank you so thank much you. so that ladies and gentlemen was raja krishnamurthy sharing his very candid and insightful thoughts with us of his journey over the last 3 and a half decades of being an actor of being a management and behavioral consultant and a social activist if that inspired you and you would like to hear more such stories Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe and catch new episodes of TRLT as they drop every Friday on our YouTube channel Nexus Consulting. Till then, stay home, stay safe and this is Venki saying bye-bye till I see you on the next episode of TRLT. Bye-bye.